just a little bit. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you? We're going live. I need to button my shirt. Um, I hope you guys are going to join me because I'm going to talk to the mayor of Seattle, a friend of mine named Jenny Durkin. Um, first of all, how are you guys doing? Tell me how you are. Um, I came on a little bit early, so um, we would have a little bit of time before Jenny joins us, although now it's seven o'clock, so so much for being super early. And here's Jenny. I'm sorry to tell you about my relationship with Jenny. We're waiting for her to join me. So if you guys have any questions about Washington State, oh, my daughter's cat. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> hey, Katie, how are you? I am good. I'm so happy to see you. And um, we're just getting people joining us now. That The wonders of modern technology. Isn't this crazy that you and I Isn't can have a crazy? conversation? Yeah, amazing. So first, catch me up. How are the girls? They're good. Um, Ellie's in Los Angeles. And Carrie is here on Long Island with us. And... Um, Ellie sadly probably has to postpone her wedding, which was supposed to be on the 4th of July. But, you know, these are high class problems in these very difficult times we're living in. Um, so we'll figure it out. But I wanted to tell everyone watching, Jenny. So everyone, this is my badass friend, Jenny Durkin. She is the mayor of Seattle. I'm so proud of her. And the reason I know Jenny is at one a long, long time ago. We were was, so young. <laughs> yeah, we were in our 20s. And Jenny was a lawyer at Williamson Conley, which is a fantastic law firm in Washington, D.C. And she worked with my late husband, Jay. And tell that sweet story that you wrote the girls after Jay passed away, Jenny, because I think it's so, it's, honestly, I hold it in my heart so much. It is. It was such a sweet thing to this day. It is. So Jay, her, Jay and I were good friends and he would catch me up on his various frolics and detours. <laughs> and every morning I'd get my time with Jay. And one day he comes and he sits on the couch and he says, I met the woman I want to marry, but I've got to ask her father for her hand. How do I do this? <laughs> it was great. And it was, you stole his heart and um, you got the two fabulous girls. My oldest son is in LA too. It's hard having your kids in a different place, isn't it? It is, although I'm really happy that Ellie gets to be in the nice weather. She lives with her fiance. She's living in sin, everyone. Uh -oh. And uh, it's so funny, my parents would not like that. But, um, you know, so she has Mark and she has a great group of friends in Los Angeles and she's got the nice weather. But Jenny, I just have to tell you, you've done such an amazing job in Seattle. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart from all the people in Seattle, even though I live very far away, I know they're so grateful for your leadership. And before we talk about the what you did in the face of this pandemic, can you just update the people who are joining us, Jenny, on the situation right now in Washington State and in the city of Seattle? Yeah, so we're really fortunate. We, um, we at the very beginning of this, when we had the first death and first cases in February 28th and 29th, which seems like a year ago. Every day it is does. a dog day. Um, and we cycle through all seven stages of grief, it seems, every hour. But at the time, they were the first outbreaks. But we were really lucky to have some researchers here who were able to type the genome of the virus and did some modeling and said, you don't have a handful of cases. You have hundreds of cases that you just haven't seen yet because you don't have testing. And they did modeling and showed that if we didn't act really quickly, we would have over 70,000 cases by this time and, and hundreds of deaths, almost the scale of what you're seeing in New York. So we were able to act really quickly to shut down a lot of our economy and the way people come together. Um, it's been hugely painful for people. I mean, so many people have lost their jobs. Um, small businesses have closed, but it looks like it's had an impact. And so I want to tell all your listeners, if they're in a stay home order, keep doing it. It matters. It's working. We're starting to see our curve flatten. Our healthcare workers may make it through this. They have been heroes on the front line. But we think that our hospitals now can take what's coming if people keep it up. But we've got at least another month of stay at home in order to keep the levels where they are. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's such an important reminder, Jenny, because I do think people get complacent. You know, I have to keep reminding myself to wash my hands as, as vigilantly as I was 
early on and to make sure that I'm not touching my face, even though I just kind of did that to my nose. Sorry, you guys, I'm really <laughs> trying to do that. But, you know, it's super, super important to continue to respect the orders. And, but, you know, uh, we're seeing this, you know, a lot, obviously, Jenny, I live in New York City. Um, did, did, so you guys acted, you were sort of the role models. And I think the Surgeon General, in fact, said that about Washington State and California being the role models for how to deal with this, with a, with a pandemic like this. So do you think that New York City did not act as quickly? I mean, I, I, which, what do you think that they might have done that would have kept it maybe slightly more contained or it's just the nature of it living in an urban area? I think it's mo I think it's a whole range of things. And like I said, we were lucky because we actually had a death um, in a neighboring town, not even in Seattle. But once we did that, we had already done some drills on pandemic. So I was able to get the researchers in who said, look, you've got a really big problem here and here's where you're headed. Um, and I think we were lucky. We learned from the Washington, the World Health Organization that to speak with one voice, so the governor, our county executive, Dow Constantine, myself, the other mayors, get in a room and these are hard decisions. I mean, to shut businesses, you know, is gonna have a huge impact on workers and small businesses. Um, and I think that we, we had the right data at the right time. And I think New York maybe didn't get as much information early. I think That's it was so surprising. Harder. Yeah, well, I think, you know, because we had that first death and we went into action. And I think until it hits your nearby, once you had that new Rochelle cluster, I think yeah. the governor started to act, but people always think that it doesn't touch them. But by that point, it clearly there was community spread. Um, I, I've got to say that your governor and mayor now have stepped up and they're doing all they can. I think in an urban area as dense as New York, where that period of time there's community spread, everybody's together. They're in the subway, they're in theaters, they're in restaurants, they're in bars. Um, and so I, I just, every day my heart breaks for New York. Um, I just well, said, I think everyone in New York, I love you. I'm so sorry you're going through this. Oh, it's just terrible. And the healthcare workers, it is like a war zone. I have so many friends, Jenny, of course, from dealing with Jay's illness and other things and just covering health and medical issues for so long who are doctors and who are nurses and who are, you know, on the front lines as respiratory therapists. And I've had conversations with them and it's, it's, it, it is like a war zone and, and is, they and, are. Yeah. And here's the thing is, we're still at that stage where we got to pull together and no one needs to be looking in the rearview mirror. How did we get here? But when we come out of this, we've got to learn the lessons. In United States of America, we should not to be having Betsy Ross circles sewing masks for our healthcare workers who are on the front lines. We shouldn't have to be searching for PPE. Everybody oh, that is so infuriating. Tested. Yeah. Well, what the hell happened, Jenny? with the PPE. I know that nobody could, well, <laughs> a lot of people actually did predict this. Uh, you know, many, many scientists, Bill Gates, if you watch the TED talk from 2015, every epidemiologist or virologist I know has said it wasn't a question of, of, of when, it, I mean, of, of, of if, it was a question of when. So, you know, it's so frustrating to people to see our medical care providers going into these war zones without the protective gear they need. Now that you're a little bit, hopefully, dear God, on the, on the sort of tail end of this, inshallah, as they say, mm -hmm. um, what, 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 what took so long? What, what, what did you learn about getting this kind of equipment and, uh, and also about the national stockpile? Yeah, I think we all have learned some valuable lessons that we're going to unfortunately keep learning as different parts of the country go through this because we're far from done. You know, even though we flattened, we still have too many people being in the hospital, getting sick, dying. Um, we have almost no testing in the city of Seattle. And we've got, I just found out this week, we've got a number of senior homes where older people are living where the infection is present. And we can't yeah. do what we should be doing to test everyone. It's isol identifying and isolating, right? Exactly. Um, and, and so, I, I look, a lot of things went wrong. It started with testing. Um, the fact that we in Seattle were blind to community spread because we were not testing who we should have been testing um, is the first thing. But then it's the stockpile and how do we have this equipment? 
and knowing that we in the United States are not immune to these kinds of events. And the preparation has to be both at the local level, but the federal level too. And um, it's enormously frustrating, I think, for every community to, it's, I, I called it like the Hunger Games. It was city versus city, state versus state, bidding for masks. Um, we're better than that as a country. And I think coming out of this, when we finally do come out of it, we've got to learn these lessons because this should not have happened in our country. And do you think, what do you think of the federal response? I mean, I know that, that we can't look in the rear view mirror, but the federal response, should there have been a national mandated shelter in place order? I mean, I'm shocked that Florida took so long to do this. And as you said, it's a world of hurt economically for people. But when you're talking about a public health crisis, why was Florida so late, late to the party? Look, I don't understand what took them so long when you saw what was happening and you see your own communities, because the other thing is we really are one nation. Um, they think that 85% of the cases in the Seattle region came from one transmission. And so we fly and travel everywhere. And so it is not like one part of our country can get through this and then we'll all be okay because we'll continue to travel and our economies are interlinked. So I do believe that the federal government should have been giving clearer direction. So everybody knew what stay home meant and every governor had, you know, whatever they ordered, it would be the same in every place and people wouldn't be confused because I tell you, most people will do what you ask them to do. Some people won't. Some people don't understand it. They don't hear the information. But mostly I hear from people is, what is it we're supposed to be doing? And I think having a national direction would have been a very helpful thing. I think so, too. Back to your original point about speaking with one voice. You know, yeah. you're hearing one state do this, one state, one city. You know, they're all competing for PPE, which is a separate issue, but you, you see these sort of um, disjointed responses. And I think that people, I, I believe, would have taken it more seriously if it was a unified response from every level of government. I think that's right. And I think it's gotta be, and everyone's t saying the same thing. It's like when we went to World War II, everybody knew what they were supposed to do and were united. And this became almost a state by state, city by city free for all that really cried out for more direction. And I got to say, though, but thank goodness for Dr. Fauci. I think having him there has been really important for the nation to be able to hear that very unfiltered truth about where we are and what we need to do to beat this thing. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, well, let me ask you about the future. Um, and by the way, if you all have any questions, I'm talking to Jenny Durkin, a friend of mine, but also happens to be mayor of Seattle. You get to a certain age and you know people in high places, right, Jenny? <laughs> I tell you, I say, who'd have thunk it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you'd have thought Kirk, you may have heard of her. She's like this national awesome kick butt person. <laughs> oh, oh, shucks, Jenny. But we're going to, you know, we're going to, well, people say stop blaming. I don't think, you know, someone just said that. And I think you know, quite honestly, we have to take a cold, hard look at how our elected officials handled this pandemic, this national health crisis. And I think it's perfectly fine to evaluate the response. And that's how we learn. That's how we move forward. That's why there was a 9-11 commission. I think there should be a uh, a COVID-19 commission to really help us appreciate and to get better uh, in the future if this happens again. But I was asking you about the, oh, somebody asked about there are still states that don't have a shelter in place order. Um, now, some of them are Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, I, we were looking up the other ones. I know I read a piece that the governor of Mississippi did not do anything, uh, didn't do things quickly enough. I talked to a friend of mine in Texas and they said they weren't worried, but that might be a, a hot spot as well. Um, why do you think some of these governors are, are kind of holding firm and not doing that? Look, I think people, people believe that if they don't see it, it doesn't exist. And I think that's the lesson we learned really quickly was because even our public health officials up until mid-February were saying they thought the risk to Seattle was low. 
um, because they weren't, if you don't see it, and we weren't testing. So if you're not broad-based testing in any of these regions, you believe it's not hitting you. But once you see it, it's almost too late. Then you are just full throttle on trying to beat it back. And we've seen it in Idaho, for example. There's a state that was very reluctant to do any of the measures. Um, and the first part of Idaho that had the most travel in and out of it, Sun Valley now, is really battling it. And its hospital's been overrun, its doctor got it. Um, and so I think that you know, part of it is just the sense that we're rural, we're immune. But if it hits a rural area, their access to hospitals is actually decreased from even urban areas. Well, that's the truth, Jenny. You know, uh, yes, people may live further apart. They may have lower population levels. But you're right. The medical facilities are much uh, less available. They don't have as big of facilities and sometimes they don't have as sophisticated equipment and as trained doctors. So it's a real problem. By the way, people are asking me, I'm drinking ginger ale, everybody. Nothing <laughs> alcoholic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's my, is it, my is drink it of choice. Yet? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's five o'clock somewhere. It's actually 716. So I could be having a drink, but I'm not. Um, I've already had a glass of wine with my high school friends who I Zoomed with. Uh, oh, this afternoon, great. which was really fun. So um, tell me a couple questions, Jenny. And again, please, if you guys have any questions for Jenny Durkin or with me, uh, for me, for that matter, please feel free to ask. Why uh, the tests? You know, we heard a couple of days ago, Jenny, that Abbott Laboratories had developed these great tests. They took five minutes to 17 minutes. And so what is going on with those tests and how come they haven't become more readily available? Because you and Governor Cuomo both say they're really the key to, to, to handling this pandemic. Yeah, so they're not only the key to handling it because you've got to do the test to know who has it and who doesn't. So, for example, in Seattle, unlike like New York, we've had a lot of firefighters and police who have been pulled off the line because they've been exposed. If we can't test them, we can't get them back to work. So they just quarantine for two weeks. Um, same with our healthcare workers, but also in our senior house to find out who doesn't have it so we can take them away from the people who do. So right. testing is still critical, but it's gonna be even more critical, Katie, when we finally as a nation try to figure out how to restart our economy. If we don't have broad-based both diagnostic testing and testing for who's had the virus, it's going to be really hard to reopen because the minute people come back together, we're going to see an uptick. And we've seen that in South Korea, which did just an amazing job of beating back the virus. But now they, are start, they saw their numbers start to stick, tick up a little. So did Hong Kong. So we know that in order to reopen the, the, the economy, it means we come together again, which is what we're all built to do. But, but where are the, the damn, Jenny, where yeah. are the damn tests? Where are the damn tests? We, we don't have enough of them. <laughs> Um, you know, part of it is supply chain. So, for example, I know more about this than I ever care to. The swabs that they use in the standard test, which are these really long swabs that they can go through the whole nose down. The I back know. Of the throat. That, that freaks me out. But yeah, you've got to do what you got to do. Most of them are made in Italy. Well, the su supply chain in Italy has been disrupted because they're in the middle of the pandemic as well. Um, other parts of the supplies came from China. Um, our masks and gowns for the healthcare workers were made primarily in China. So when there's disruption there, we couldn't get it. So we're going to have to do a whole assessment going forward on how do we make sure that we can secure enough of our own supply chain to keep our hospital workers safe, to have enough testing, and really open up our economy when we bring people back together to do the things that we haven't been able to do and won't be able to do for months. We need to have broad-based testing. So hopefully that will get remedied. Meanwhile, you said you have another month of shelter in place. Uh, is that right in, in Washington State yeah, and we Seattle? Are, we, have stay, we have stay at home till at least May, 14, May 4th. Um, and it could go beyond that. We're really watching the numbers because um, we can't afford to, to let our foot off the gas too early because if it spikes again, it's gonna be much harder to control. Um, and we, why do you say that? Because I think people are very fatigued. I think we have run through a lot of our supplies um, and we are, we've measured everything to get us to where we need to get. 
Um, but if there is a resurgence, I think it will have a huge psychological impact on people, but it'll also have an impact on what happens to our hospitals, our PPE, all those things that are getting us through this then are going to be, you know, further stressed. And then if our businesses can't open, people won't be able to pay their rent and buy food and all of that. So it's going to be require us to do this together as a nation. Reopening is as important as how we close down. And that's where we, again, are going to need really strong leadership from the federal government. And, and, and also better safe than sorry, right? I mean, yes. all the efforts to flatten the curve, if people start ignoring social distancing and all the, the preventative measures, uh, as you said, it will be all for naught and more people will get sick and more people will die. Right, and you, and can see this, you can almost see the spikes because it takes about two weeks to show up. A person gets exposed, they get sick, it incubates. By the time they're really sick and present to the hospital, it's been about two weeks. And so you think you can be doing well, but if, you, if people start to, to go to old habits, suddenly you're gonna see a spike in cases um, and then that, because there's more community spread, and then it, you, you have that exponential growth. That's the hard thing that people don't realize is this virus spreads generally for every person who gets it, they spread it to two or three people. So it doubles every five to six days and even more quickly sometimes. The way we were able to flatten the curve, the reason we keep people apart is because then they can't transmit it to someone. And we were able to drive that down that it transmitted to just one to one and a half people. Still too many, but, but that's the, the only tool we have and it's really primitive. And I know Microsoft and Facebook both told their employees to work from home beginning in early March, which is a week before the official orders. And I know that you believe that probably helped with your efforts. It was huge. And I mean, I, that's the thing that the pace of this has been phenomenal. So we heard about the first infection in King County on Friday, February 28th, at the end of the day, the first death the next day on February 29th. And at the beginning of the next week, we as the city of Seattle, were calling our employers and meeting with researchers saying, we think it's bigger than this. And we think everybody's got to work from home. And we have, um, you know, 12,000 employees in the city of Seattle. We had as many telecommute as possible, all of our big employers. And that helped tremendously in the first step of disrupting the face-to-face. -face. And, and uh, what do you think about, gosh, you know, I think I asked this question, sorry, I just touched my face, <laughs> of all these experts I interview. And, you know, I think the bottom line is, I don't know why I keep asking it. It's because I think it's human nature. But when do you think things will keep, be able to get back to normal. And I'll get the numbers. Someone's asking about the numbers in Seattle and how many people died and how many people got sick, which I'm sure you know. But before before I ask you about that, um, you know, is it going to be midsummer? Is it going to is this going to be through the summer? So I think we don't know yet, Katie. And I'd like to give people more hope than that and say it's going to be by X date. But I think we are going to have to because we're going to have to do this in sectors of the country and nation, we've got to be really careful. And I know, I think we in Seattle, um, the governor just announced yesterday that the school year is online through the rest of the year. So school is suspended. And I think we'll see some more things like that where we're just gonna say, look, we got to get through May maybe, or through parts of June. And then we have to see what's happening in other parts of the country because we are so interconnected. And then what is normal? Because it's not like we can then just say, okay, let's all have sporting events where 50,000 people come back together. Because if we can't test, people will get sick again. Because remember, the way we've, we've kind of started to beat this is people are separated. So the virus can't transmit. But as soon as people come back together again, all you need is one infected person to start that cycle all over. Right. So... It, we won't be in true normal until there's a vaccine and broad scale testing, but I think we'll start to get more normalized, you know, through the summer and the fall. And, and my friend Charlie is asking about grocery stores. And I was reading about the number of grocery store workers who have died. And a lot of the customers are not practicing social distancing in the grocery store. They're not wearing uh, masks to uh, to to keep them from infecting other people. They say they're terrified. And uh, 
Yeah, I mean, and that's I, the thing is, I think part of that is that clear direction we were talking about, right? That everybody knows what the rules are and every store goes by the same rules. And we've even been talking about that here where we've got some really good grocery stores who like one-way aisles. When you come up, they give you your wipe, you climb, they wipe down the basket. There's no gathering. They have places marked at this checkout stand so everyone's socially distanced. Um, and so I think we need to have kind of more consistency with that because it, it is hard for people. Um, the, 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 in Seattle, it's be, one of the things they first did was they were going to have senior hours. So anyone 16 right. over, which I kind of resent that 16 over. Woo! Is senior. <laughs> I know. When I hear that, I'm like, Woo, what? Woo, let's go seniors. <laughs> Um, but look, we, they did it and senior hours mob because everyone's up and ready to go. So we had to kind of figure out how to, you know, not have the mob scene at senior hour. Yeah. Well, um, I think you should run for president, Jenny. <laughs> I tell you, this, is anyone even paying attention right now to anything political? I think not. In some ways that's refreshing, but We've got it a, is, but I think it's very interesting how this is going to affect the election. Any thoughts? Because, you know, yeah, it's I very think, difficult. I don't think we know yet because I don't know how we come out of this. Because one of the things we don't know yet is the social impacts on people in such personal ways. So many people will have lost someone they loved. And right now they can't really even grieve for them because they can't have funerals or services. Oh, it's heartbreaking. That's it's one of the, the most cruel things about this disease, Jenny, is that, you know, uh, friend, Ellie has a friend she went to college with and her grandmother died. She was in a nursing home and uh, her mom and, and, and Ellie's friend, the, her granddaughter, they had to say goodbye to her on FaceTime. And it is just... Uh. So I know. I mean, that was one of the things. Heart it's so heartbreaking. When I went and toured the hospital here, that's kind of the front lines of it when this started, and talking to one of the nurses, I said, you know, what can I get you? What do you need? And she said, if you could get us some iPhones, because they can't see their family as they go, and we like to be able to, for them to at least call or FaceTime them. I mean, it's so heartbreaking at individual levels, and so many people economically will be devastated that I think the people who will be voting in November are completely different than the people who we were as a nation at the beginning of February. Everything has changed. And what matters to us has been painted in very stark relief. Um, and I think people are going to be very sober and demand that their government can stand up and help them and be there when they need them. I think you're right. Um, and I think it, it's a yeah. I think you're right. It's a it's a very very tough time for people. Uh, as you point out, Jenny, I talked to Robert Reich about uh, the working class, and there's so many people. You know, many of us are very lucky and fortunate, and we're able to be in a house and not have huge financial concerns. There's so many people. I think 40 percent of the American people cannot deal with an unexpected expense of $400. That was according to a piece in the Atlantic a while ago. And um, it just, you know, people are really going to be suffering. So I, I know, is, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, it's like there were two classes of vulnerable, right? There were the people who are vulnerable to get the virus. And then there were the economically vulnerable who suffered from the fight against the virus. And we, we saw, as we prepared for this, we knew the impacts that this would really, in stark relief, show where those economic disparities were. So we hustled really quickly to say, what do we do to help people individually? So I signed an order saying no residential evictions and no small business evictions and no nonprofits. We promised people that utilities would be kept on we converted some city monies we had to go to grocery voucher program to just put money in people's hands so they could buy groceries. We started this program for small businesses that a very num few number of employees, just $10,000 grants because it's hard to give government money to individuals. And we had you know, so many more businesses who needed it than we could give it. But the ones who got it, I mean, some of the most uplifting stories of the day were people who were saying, I think I'm going to be okay at least for the next month. Um, and I think that Congress has acted. We got to get that money in people's pockets as quickly as we can 
so that people don't fall even further behind because we know there was huge economic disparities in our country to begin with. And this is really going to show those and highlight those if we don't both act with relief in the right ways, but also as we come out of it, start thinking about how do we make sure we take care of each other as a country? Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe this will help us uh, rediscover our souls in a way and what's oh, important. I just, I just interviewed Vivek Murthy, who was the Surgeon General in the Obama administration. He just wrote a book about loneliness and social isolation. It's going to be on my podcast this week. And, uh, you know, he said human connections and helping our neighbors. I think we sort of have lost our way a little bit. And so maybe through this crisis, we'll appreciate you know, the, the basic things ab about what helps people live a rich and fulfilling life, which is human connection and helping people and being of service. And as someone just said, our humanity, I'm not going to keep you any longer, Jenny, you are such a, 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 such a pal to spend this time with me. You know, I think my followers are really enjoying and appreciating these conversations because I'm able to talk to important people like you. And honest, honestly, uh, I should say Governor Inslee has also done a remarkable job. He's been and terrific. He's been we did, great. We, did, we didn't mention him. And I want to give him a shout out to along with all your colleagues in, in state and local and, and city government. So please thank them all for us. Um, I don't even live in Washington State. But on behalf of everyone who does, and for, for being a role model to the rest of the nation, I salute you, Jenny Jerkin. <laughs> well, I blow you kisses because, look, we are all in this together. And if any one positive thing can come out is if we can rediscover our common humanity and be more united instead of as divided as we've been recently, I think that would be a really good thing for all of us. So yeah, keep it up, Katie. You're helping people. People need this. They need to talk. They need to listen. They need to hear. They need to be connected. And you're doing a great thing. So thanks for well. everything you're doing. I'm trying. And Jenny, are you getting my newsletter wake up call every morning? I am. I read it every morning. Well, listen, I might get a quote from you because we're just celebrating our one year anniversary. And if everybody isn't reading it, it's a way to not have to watch television or listen to the news all day long. Just go to katiekirk.com and sign up. We have a group of hardworking women who are doing it day in and day out. So we really appreciate the support. And Jenny, thank you for reading it yourself. Tell your friends. That's right. And everyone should read it because you know what? The less we watch the news right now, the better it is for us all emotionally. I'm not going to tell my friends in TV <laughs> news you said that. Uh, shh, don't tell them. Okay. All right. Except Jenny, for them. thanks so much. Lots See of you later, love Katie. to you. Take care. Take care. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye Jenny. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See ya.